a moment ago. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2 together. We're going to read verses 9 through 18. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, from whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely is it not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Father, thank you for this text, for this beautiful book. I pray today during this time we have, Lord, that we can honor you with the things that are said and the things that are highlighted. I give glory to you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the time that we have to both study it and also to hear it preached and to read it ourselves, for ourselves, as we go from verse by verse, line by line, precept upon precept. May our eyes be open, Lord, to your truth today. May we come from this place knowing who Jesus Christ is more and more. For it is of him and through him and to him that all things exist. Awaken us, Lord, and open our eyes today that we might behold wondrous things from your law. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Well, we don't all have the benefit of being here during this entire study of Hebrews. We're just starting and we've gone through the first chapter and gone through the second chapter all the way through the eighth chapter. And you'll notice in the scriptures there when you read the eighth verse of chapter 2, as it highlights putting everything under their feet. And it says, putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. And in the first section of this second chapter, the preacher is emphasizing Adam and Eve and their dominion over the entire world in the creation. God created all of the earth and in the last day of his creation, the sixth day he created Adam. And then from Adam came Eve and these two were given a covenant headship that included dominion and authority over all God's creation. As we noted the different aspects of you see the sky and the, and the water and the ruler of the sky of the birds, the king over that kingdom, and the animals, the king over the, anim, over the kingdoms of the earth, and the vegetation 
and how everything that he created, and the last thing he did was he said to Adam, you have dominion over all these things. And he placed him in a position of authority, but it was authority under control and under a covenant. And that covenant was the covenant of dominion over creation. And he said to Adam, in the Garden of Eden, in this covenantal relationship, you may eat anything in all this garden for your food, except for one thing, and that is the tree that's right in the midst of the garden. That I, and we talked about that. That midst of the garden doesn't mean it's just hidden over someplace and maybe overgrown. It's literally right in the prominent place in the garden so that he can see it constantly. To know that that is forbidden for him to eat that fruit. And in time, Eve was tempted. She ate the fruit. Adam ate the fruit. And the part of that covenant was that if you do not eat the fruit, you will live. You continue to live, and it's not, it's not you will start living, you will continue living, living. And before this time, there's no death. It's only life in all the earth. Something that I want to note when it comes to the need of death and evolution, an evolutionary humanistic perspective of creation. But in this covenant that God made, He said, however, when you eat that fruit, if you eat that fruit, you will die. Death will come. And surely it did. He became dead to God. He became alive to himself. He self-realized and his whole life changed. Everything about him changed. He didn't feel like he was owner of anything or governor over anything or had, had authority over anything. And he lost this covenant relationship with God. And he brought sin. And as we, as we read in other portions of Corinthians, for example, 15th chapter, we recognize that the, the quality of sin is death. Paul said in Romans, the wages of sin is death. Death came into the creation and death came into the world. And this authority and this position of covenant representative was lost by Adam. And as a result, when he's talking about them He's talking about not only Adam and Eve, but he's talking about every person born from Adam and Eve. And the scripture declares that everyone born since Adam is what? Dead. They're in a state of death. Even the creation, Romans chapter 8, tells us the creation groans for the coming of redemption because it too is in this grip of death. And so the author brings that forward in this text all the way up through verse 8 and then in verse 9 he says but we do see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while that same description Adam little lower than the angels Adam couldn't fly Adam couldn't go between heaven and earth and eternity. He, didn't, he, didn't, he, had, he was very weak in so many things. And his, even his unfallen state, just his weaknesses, because he's not as great as an angel. There's some interesting discussions on why Satan fell when Adam was created and given dominion, because he was less than an angel. But we won't go there. We want to stay within the context of our 20 minutes left. And before we begin to dis I start discerning where part three is going to begin in this sermon. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but we see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And we see this comparison between Adam and Eve and their progeny and Jesus now coming onto the scene. And they're described in the same way. And so we start seeing some unique things about Jesus. And we, we saw those in the very first chapter when 
It said in the past, God spoke to us through all the prophets and the wise people and so forth. But in these last days, he's speaking to us through his son. And so the idea of these last days has now been repeated twice. It's repeated in um, verses 5 through 8 here. The idea of a, a new covenantal time frame is coming. And Jesus is bringing that new covenantal time frame. But he is lower than the angels. The similarity to that is striking. And it fortifies the idea of his incarnate relationship. When I say that, in flesh. Jesus was born. Like every person in this room was born. He was conceived. He became a, a living person through his birth with a tremendous exception, and that is he was conceived not by his earthly father Joseph, who would have passed on a sin nature to him, but he's conceived by the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary. And so what was born of her, it says, was of God. And he comes onto the scene, not just as a man under Adam's race, but now as a man under God's race, under God's generation generating him he's still a man and with him we learn in John chapter 1 with Jesus at his time of both conception and then in birth he is accompanied shares his flesh with the second member of the trinity the word of God the word became flesh the word came into flesh shared flesh with the man Jesus Christ now We've talked about this for a long time, and I'm not going to back up and talk about it much more right now. And so I, I just want to say this is a continuation of our study as we've seen this incarnate relationship. So when you hear the term Jesus Christ, it's Jesus the man, Christ the anointed one, the, the one who created the oil, the word of God, and these two share the same flesh from their moment of conception to the moment of his death and then beyond that. But it tells us here that he was crowned, his, his uniqueness, Jesus' uniqueness, although he was lower than the angels, he's also a man, his uniqueness is he was crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for every one, every human one, every fallen one, and specifically for those that he calls his own, his people, those whom God has given him, the elect. Now we see this highlighted for us in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 21. I hope you can turn there and look at this in your own Bibles. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, to be sure sin was in the world before the law was given under Moses, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as Adam did, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, Adam, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, also overflow to many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. You hear the same kind of language, don't you? For if by the trespass of the one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man in all people, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one, notice the one man, Jesus Christ. 
Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification for the, and for the life of all people. For just as the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ. So he really, Paul is expanding, or at least in, in, this, in, his, in this epistle of Romans, he's expanding on this same exact idea that the author of Hebrews is presenting here. Just a little parenthetical thought about authorship at that point. It's not some accident. Hebrews was written far, at, far after Paul wrote to the Romans and all of his epistles. And here we see, he's kind of in, it wasn't long after, but it was after. As a result, we see something that sounds almost like the same thing being discussed. And so the question always, well, Paul must have wrote both of these books. Well, there's, the strongest evidence is that he didn't write Hebrews. However, the thing that I have said, and I said this last time as we talked about this, we talk a little pieces of this kind of historical context as we come into a study, especially at the first. But we see that Paul may not have written Hebrews, but it was certainly written by someone who understood and was instructed by Paul. Hence, it gives rise to the idea that Paul gave Apollos, for example, I'm not saying Apollos is the author, okay? They, but Apollos was instructed by Aquila, Priscilla, who were disciples of Paul. And he, they, he, gave them, he gave Apollos to them and said, instruct him. And so he was instructed by them. And that's one of the theories that Apollos wrote Hebrews. But no one knows who wrote Hebrews. It stands alone still as the, one of the few books and epistles, especially in the Bible, New Testament, that doesn't have a known author, which was, as I said last week, the second Mark and the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. when they were putting together known books that they thought bore the, the, the mark of being in a canonization together, a collection together as the Word of God, the New Testament records. The second thing, the first thing was always that it must bear the marks of inspiration, God's breath coming through it. And the second one was it also must have a known author person that we can know was the author of this book. And this is one of the few exceptions to that, of who the known author is. But it bears so much a resemblance to everything else that's there that we see that there's, I think there was a nine or ten different categories of things that had to be present for someone, something to be brought into the canon of Scripture. All that's um, for just your interest. In verse 10, in bringing many sons and daughters into glory, it is fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Curious, isn't it? Why would suffering be something that was some kind of a recognizable thing? Well, Everyone suffers. What, what, who, it's just unnatural. Who do, we, who do we really, really admire? Someone who, like in the Gulag of Archipelago, you know, the Solzhenitsyn's book of just suffering, constantly suffering, suffering, suffering. And who stands out amongst those, this dread system of death and suffering is the few who would not recant their faith. They stood strong to the point where Solzhenitsyn makes the, the case that people will take all kinds of things and apply this, this beautiful um, autobiography to. They'll apply it to social trends. They'll supply it, supply it to the you know, political issues. He said, this is a case of Christ. Unique difference in those lives of those men, because there's no women, but the men, there were some, women were somewhere else, is Christ. And here we see that Jesus, this man, although he is incarnate, still incarnate God, he 
set himself apart by suffering. Not just suffering and then getting through the suffering, but suffering and maintaining his trust and belief in God. And he says here, both the one who makes people holy, Jesus, and those who are made holy are similar to one another. Can you imagine saying that, that how salvation works is that God just simply said, I'm God. I'm all powerful. I forgive everybody for their sins. Well, he would not be God, would he? Because he wouldn't be just. He wouldn't even keep his own rules. He wouldn't be God. He would change to do that. He would have to, he would have to compromise. He just wouldn't be God. And so as a result, Jesus is... Bear with me. Careful here. This is a very precise hair we need to cut. Jesus is not God. Jesus is incarnate man and God. He is brought into the world, conceived as a man, in order to have an identity with those whom God is going to save, and that is people, human beings like you and like me. If Jesus was pre-existent God, can pre-existent God die? Can God die? Think about that. Who died on the cross? A man. And a man had, was necessary for it. And that's the whole point he's making here. The one who makes the people holy and those who are being made holy are of the same family. The same race, the same substance. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare to you, I, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. And again, very Pauline in that, give a lot of illustrations, right? And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, I am here. And the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, verse 14, he too shared in their humanity. So that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. Adam failed in his covenant relationship he brought death into the world, and Satan ruled over that whole kingdom of the world in death. From the time of Adam's sin all the way to the time of Jesus. Do you believe that? I guess I could just say, do you believe this? Since the children have flesh and blood, in verse 14, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death... His suffering, his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and he might be free, he might free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. You know, up until the time you die, fear of death is what keeps you going. <laughs> you know, I'm not afraid to die until you're right in the face of it and you find out who, whether you're afraid or not. And I can stand back here and intellectually say, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to die. But you get me in the right circumstances where I'm going to die, it starts to be something very, very serious in the minds of people. And a person who is outside of the covenant of faith this folds like a, just folds in the face of death. Trying to do anything to preserve himself or herself. Why? Because that's the only thing they have is life in this life. And their life is in death. Their life is death. Their darkness is their light, as Jesus said. In verse 16, for surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Does this seem interesting to you? For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. This reference to Abraham rather than Adam. 
Where did the sin come from? Adam. Did Adam live after or before Abraham? He was the first one to be alive. Everything else came from him. Abraham came from him. I was curious. Why is he saying Abraham when it's Adam? All those descendants of Adam. Because all those descendants of Adam, including all of us, have a couple things in stark similarity. Death is one of them. And sin is one of them. That's what we all have in common. All of us. Jesus' redemptive work at the cross did not instantly reverse the curse or universally redeem redeem all of Adam's descendants. Jesus could have just died on the cross and everybody since Adam is free. If that was God's plan. However, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection did, did fully atone for all those who had the same kind of faith which Adam demonstrated. And what is faith? If I get everybody to stand up here just for a minute, I'm going to have faith in you. I'm going to jump off my eyes closed head first. It's faith. I get the faith in you. I got faith. I can do that. And we've heard this term, blind faith. <laughs> That's a blind faith. That's foolish faith. That's carnal faith. But real faith comes from something else and is really is something else. Notice the Apostle Paul's assessment again of the value and extent of the faith of Abraham and its relationship to all those who exerted the same kind of faith. This is the kind of faith that Abraham had. And is, this, is it just blind faith? Is that what he's talking about? Blind faith? Is that what he's saying? In Romans chapter 4. Again, it's a fairly lengthy passage in 9 through 25. We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstance was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before he was circumcised? It was not after, but before. It's not just because he was Jewish. It's not just because he was in covenant relationship to God under the law of Moses. Was Abraham under the law of Moses? Later, yeah. Much later. Death was there. Sin was there. I've lost my place very nicely here. So then he is the father of all who... Have faith. Is that what it says there in Romans? Of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to him. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, not only who the ones who are circumcised, but also who follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Still using this word faith, right? It is not through the law, verse 13, that Abraham and his offering received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. Again, faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, in verse 16, the promise comes by faith so that by, so it may be so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. That's interesting. Abraham's offspring, and now he's saying that the offspring are those who are identified as persons of faith. Offsprings are usually identified by those that are birthed from you or from your children. But he's saying here that Abraham's Generations are identified by faith. Not they look like Abraham or they came after Abraham. They're those who had faith. The faith that Abraham, where he, well, I'm gonna, I don't want to say that yet. 
Okay? Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Notice this word of all of them. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of all those who have his faith. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God. Here's the key. Are you reading with me? In whom he believed. And God gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Now notice the similarity. And say with me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead. Dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have say, you are saved. What is faith? It's belief in what God says. What God says. Whether it's ancient belief in what God says, whether it's informed belief by the law, whether it's a super informed belief by the New Testament writings, anyone who believes God has faith. Belief is the substance of faith. For by grace you're saved through faith. The word faith is synonymous with belief. For belief you are saved. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever had faith in him, well, but, is that what it says? Whoever believes in him, believes in his death, his burial, his resurrection, his promises, his word being true. I, 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 I think the, the author may have wanted, of course, I'm being tongue-in-cheek here, okay? Certainly not going to rewrite the Bible. But he would have been, right here, would have been a great time to put chapter 11 in. By faith, Abraham, by faith, by faith, by faith. Going all the way through this whole long list of people who believed in God. And it finally gets to a guy named Moses. He said, wait a minute. Or Abraham come before Abraham. There's other people had faith. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. They believed in God. They believed in God. They were looking, it says, for someone. In verse 18 of the same Romans 9, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it has been said to him, so your offspring will be. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord? Do you believe that he rose from the dead? Do you believe that? Do you have faith in that? Is that where your faith springs from? That belief is what saves us. Against all hope. In hope, Abraham believed. And so became the father of many nations. Just as it is said to him, so shall your offspring be. Who's that? Who's his offspring? All those who believe. Is that us? Is that you? Is that me? Now, you know some people that don't believe, right? They don't believe. They can't believe. They don't, it's not just they won't believe. They can't believe. No one can come to the Father unless he brings them. You have not chosen me, Jesus said. I've chosen you. And retained you. Chose you to be appointed He gives this illustration without waking his faith. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Again, they're just, they're just using this word interchangeably. Belief, faith, belief, faith. And his faith belief and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Do you have belief? Are you persuaded that God can accomplish what he desires? And do you add all kinds of criteria, New Testament criteria to that? You think you have any more faith than Enoch had? Has he trusted God? Has anybody in this room ever heard of anybody just being not dying, that just God just loves them so much and they're so filled with, with belief, but he just takes them off with him? He just took them. 
He walked with God, I said. And God, Bill says, he took him. I, my, my uncle Ed, great preacher from down in, in Georgia. At my grandmother's funeral, he preached, Enoch walked with God. I still remember every part of it. As he said, Mama Bales, walk with God. And he took her. Death doesn't, that's not our end. Death doesn't scare us. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? We have a better hope, don't we? A much better hope. I, I was, I've told people during this COVID context, you have people that suddenly, have, they have COVID. They're sick. They, they, people, they're going to die. I said, stop a second. You are recipient of another view of life. It's not the life that comes to the end in this world. It's our blessed hope of the life that never ends. You have the best of both things. If you're healed, you're healed for the glory of God. If you die, you go and be with Christ for the glory of God. Now, that, is the, that is the hope. And we got a little taste of it during this COVID time, didn't we? Didn't we? We saw people that really did die. I can remember being on the phone, praying for my brother that God would heal my brother. And I literally listened as the doctor called for everybody to come and try to awaken him from his heart attack and death of COVID. I just can't tell you the, the, the grip of how that touches you. But there's another grip that's there, and that is he has eternal life with Christ. Do you believe that? No matter how bad things are, we have this blessed hope. We have the hope of God deliverance now, as Paul said. I, if God keeps me alive, I'm here for your blessing. If God takes me, I'm double blessed. So little of us really come into a confrontational position with that, do we? But often we do. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The word credited to him were written not for him only, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead. He will be delivered over to death for our sins. And he was raised to life for our justification. Oh, God, thank you for this blessed hope. Listen. Be careful to listen. So open this whole chapter open up. Be careful to listen. Be careful to Keep yourself in this context, this currency, with this message. To keep yourself in a position of reminding yourself. Remember what the Apostle Peter said in his last words to the church? He said, I've been preaching this grace to you all during my life. And I'm making arrangements so that when I die, someone else is going to come and preach the same message to you. We need to hear this message again and again and again and again. Because we so easily drift off into, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. What's really making you afraid? Someone come and whisper in your ear, you're not really saved. You're not really saved. Look at you. You're not really, God didn't really love you. You know, just, just don't worry about all the experience. Don't think, worry about the things you come through. Don't worry about any of that. You're not really saved. It's, it's a very, you think, that's not a very effective message. Oh, it sure is. Boy, you get into, into a tough place when you have suffering of some kind or difficulties or some kind of challenge. It's real easy, isn't it? I'm just not sure. His pastor, I literally heard hundreds of people say to me, I'm just not really sure about my faith. Help me, pastor, to, to have, let my faith become back. In a prison context, guys are always saying, I want more faith, I want more faith, I want more faith. I said, stop, stop, stop. Let's look. That's a good thing. We'll get on that in a minute. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Yes, I do, but I need more. Wait. Do you believe that Jesus was buried? Yes. 
You sure you do? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Yes. But stop. The scripture declares that if you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what does it say? The conclusion we come to. You are saved. God is concerned with what we do and how we do it and whether we do it well or do it bad, but ultimately all those things are swallowed up by the blood of Jesus Christ for us already. And these moments of temptation, these moments of doubt, these moments of fear are moments where the Spirit takes that moment to awaken us again to what the reality is. That we have eternal life and all of our sin has been ransomed. It's been purchased, says in Ephesians chapter 1. He ransomed us. He purchased us, all of us, like a car, as is. You better make sure your car is good. You purchase it as is. You can't go back and say, well, yeah, I, but, I, but this, this clutch isn't working. Or this other thing. You bought it as is. Jesus bought us as is and loved us. He redeemed us and he forgives every sin. So what are we worried about? You know, you don't ask yourself, can God forgive me for that? Can God forgive me for that? Or God won't forgive me for that? You know, that's the enemy talking to you. That's the devil. That's the one who used to be in charge. You know, when you did something, you really had huge consequences. You know, it's life and death. That's the, old, that's the old guy talking to you. The Holy Spirit says, he forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Do you believe that? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Selah. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Sing about it. Pray about it. Talk about it. We spend too much time talking about, oh, I used to be, oh, now look at me now. You know, I used to be a Christian. <laughs> you know, used to be a Christian? What do you mean used to be a Christian? If you used to be, you think you used to be a Christian, you weren't a Christian to start with. That's not the product of faith and belief believes and it cannot not believe praise the lord part three part three just draw a line part three next time if you want to hear next time by distance wait for the tape it'll come out eventually <laughs>